In Yu-Gi-Oh, there are three standard ways of winning the duel. The most common well known is reducing your opponent's life points to zero, with the second being your opponent surrendering, and the third being a deck out. But as well as the game's main win conditions, there's also a number of alternative win conditions caused by card effects that we're going to explore today and discuss why they never really took off and the issues with alternative win conditions as a whole. In order to understand the downsides of alternative win conditions, it's important to realize why Yu-Gi-Oh's standard win conditions are so successful. With the main reason being that every deck in the game is capable of winning by at least one of these conditions. Reducing your opponent's life points to zero is the most common way that you'll see a duel won, and you can do this either with effect or battle damage. And because most decks in the game use monsters in some capacity, either as combo tools or as interruption, it's likely your deck has ways to deal damage. But there are rare decks out there that don't play monsters. A ton of Mystic Mind strategies refuse to play monsters at all, and instead are relying on battle damage, use other options to win. One variant of Mystic Mind uses Cauldron of the Old Man in order to gradually burn your opponent using effect damage, virtually achieving the same win condition as battle damage, just through a different means. But as a going second tool and a non-dedicated mind strategy, Mystic Mind's main win condition is deck out. A condition achieved where a player must draw without having cards in their deck. Assuming you go second, it's likely that your opponent has went through more cards in their deck, so if you activate Mystic Mind and they have no way to out it, you've essentially guaranteed to always have more cards in your deck and can just sit on that mind until your opponent runs out of cards in their deck. But you don't need a Mystic Mind to have a chance of winning by deck out, as during long and grueling games, one player is eventually going to run out of resources. And finally, the last normal win condition is when your opponent surrenders, something they can do at any point regardless of the game state, which is why a lot of match winners like Victory Dragon are pretty bad. What these three ways of winning have in common is that they're all easily achievable since the game has been built around at least one of these three win conditions always being a possibility no matter the state of the game. If you have a monster in your deck, you're going to be able to threaten your opponent's life points with the battle phase. And because deck sizes are limited to a maximum of 60 cards, one player at some point is going to run out of cards in their deck. And the way surrendering works allows either player the opportunity to concede the game and move on to the next one if they feel as if a situation is unwinnable or it will take too much time. In general, these three win conditions have been extremely successful since they form the basis of the entire game mechanics and influence card design as a result. Most decks throughout the game's history have won duels only using these particular win conditions, relying on their consistency and reliability to win games above a more gimmicky alternative. But that begs the question, why are alternative win conditions seen as less consistent and gimmicky? In theory, alternative win conditions are fun ways of changing up the mechanics of a duel for both you and your opponent. When a deck has a way of winning the game through unusual means, the dynamic of the game changes, as it forces your opponent to do whatever they can to prevent you from reaching a particular board state, becoming a game of cat and mouse. Certain alternative win conditions can even be used to catch your opponent off guard, and because the opponent's deck is likely built to counter decks going for standard win conditions, they may even fail to have an effective counter in their deck for your strategy, especially given the variance of alternative win conditions. In practice, however, alternative win conditions are often clunky and ill-suited towards competitive play, as actually achieving these win board states is an incredibly difficult task. Purposefully so, as most alternative win conditions have been designed to be difficult, or slow to set up to prevent them from being used to FDK your opponent before they have a chance to play. As a result, most of, if not all of Yu-Gi-Oh's alternative win conditions require a very specific and peculiar action to occur, or need multiple turns in order to actually win the game. This makes them inherently awkward to use, as they often require a whole deck built to facilitate them, rather than something that's achieved naturally through normal gameplay like a standard win condition. Currently, most strategies built to facilitate alternative win conditions have to rely on brittle combo lines that are very weak to hand traps, or restricting the opponent with the use of floodgates to stop them from playing the game as much as possible. Exodia is the literal face of alternative win conditions, being the first card in the game which allowed you to win purely by a card effect. This effect was made iconic by the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, which saw Yugi using Exodia to win what appeared to be an unwinnable duel by drawing the final piece on his last turn. Unfortunately, Exodia decks the TCG, OCG, and Master Duel play very differently to how it was used in the anime. Instead of using the Exodia pieces as secondary options to use just in case, most decks that play Exodia are trying to turbo the pieces to their hand as quickly as possible. This means that these decks are mainly built up of cards that allow them to either search or draw multiple times before your opponent has an opportunity to reduce your life points to zero. This has led to the creation of a number of different Exodia variants. Draw Spell Exodia, usually just known as Exodia, builds the deck exclusively by using draw spells and search cards to get the pieces as fast as possible. In the modern era, there are a number of supplementary engines you can use to play that achieve this goal. The Sky Striker engine, for example, allows you to abuse Engage not being once per turn, and the Bamboo Swords are an engine based around Broken Bamboo Sword and Golden Bamboo Sword to give your deck a free pot of greed. Although, in the past, these archetypal engines were quite sparse and so the majority of Exodia decks are built around purely generic draw spells and searchers that are still around in these strategies to this day. 
Upstart Goblin and One Day Apiece, for example, are excellent choices for draw spells, since you can activate them at any point to keep running through your deck. In older and slower formats, Exodia decks also had access to a number of trap cards to help them draw spells. Reckless Greed and Jar of Greed were great ways to thin your deck during your opponent's turn. All wall cards like Threatening Roar and Wabaku protected your life points if you even wanted to, as these variants also played Hope for Escape, a card which allows you to draw one card for every 2,000 life point difference between you and your opponent, allowing you to realistically draw up to three or even four cards at a time. In 2012, this style of Exodia deck even managed to place top eight in the World Championship, which is incredibly impressive for a deck based solely around an alternative win condition, and technically makes Exodia the best alternative win condition in the game when based on results alone. This variant was fairly strong, especially for its era, as it was capable of playing around some of the best decks of the time like Insectors, a deck that was extremely popular for its ability to wipe fields. And Exodia didn't need to commit a card to the field in order to win, and any card it did commit, like a trap card, could just be flipped face up if your opponent tried to destroy it, meaning that it saw competitive success specifically because of the way it changed how a duel worked and actually fulfilled its goal as an effective win condition. The build essentially formed the blueprint for most modern Exodia strategies, such as Royal Magical Library Exodia, for example. This uses the aforementioned draw spells alongside Royal Magical Library, an effect monster that gains a spell counter each time it's activated, and you can remove three counters from it in order to draw a card. This effect isn't once per turn and allows you to keep drawing cards, provided you can keep providing it with spells for spell counters. And because every spell in an Exodia strategy is based around replacing itself by drawing a card, your Royal Magical Library will always be supplied with spell counters, basically giving you an extra way of drawing cards for free and ensuring more consistency. There's also Treasure Panda Exodia, which again uses the same DNA as Draw Spell Exodia and Royal Magical Library Exodia, except with Treasure Panda as the star of the show. With Treasure Panda, you can banish any spell trap in your graveyard to summon a normal monster from your deck with the same level as the number of cards you banished. And it just so happens it's not once per turn, a common theme with Exodia strategies, which allows you to keep banishing spells from your graveyard to summon out four or five pieces. And with that, you can use them as link materials for something like Saryuja in order to draw more cards and add them back to your hand with Dark Factory Mass Production. Treasure Panda also allows for the facilitation of another Exodia strategy, which brings all of the pieces to your field, but uses give and take to special summon true Exodia to your opponent's side of the field, resulting in an alternative loss condition for your opponent. Every one of these versions of Exodia can change the game in the same way. With minimal or low commitment to the field, you can still win the game based purely on your draw engine alone. And because this way of winning doesn't require a battle phase, it's possible to do it on your first turn and FDK your opponent, which is something that's more than possible in the modern era thanks to the new and supplementary engines. But it's the modern era which is also these variants' biggest issue. The end boards of decks in 2012 featured cards that Exodia could undercut. Insectors could destroy boards with the use of Hornet, and Dino Rabbit was only really capable of negating a single spell or trap per turn with Logia. This, combined with the slow nature of the format back then, meant that Exodia had a real chance when going second, as it was likely that at least a part of their engine was going to resolve and get them to Exodia. Or in the case where it didn't, they could rely on surviving a couple of extra turns to draw what they need, even if they didn't have a card like Swiss Scarecrow to protect them with. The modern era, however, has been much less kind to Exodia. More end boards focus on the idea of negation, reaching more boss monsters that are more than capable of interacting with Exodia decks, and the speed of the modern game is much faster, so you get no second chances of dealing with your opponent if you can't FDK them with Exodia. Because of this, a lot of draw spell variants of Exodia and other alternative win conditions reliant on FDKing will not play hand traps or board breakers, virtually necessities for most modern decks as they need every single card in their engine to facilitate their win condition, and drawing a Ghost Ogre or Effect Veiler is going to be virtually useless to them when compared to something like a Broken Bamboo Sword. And this highlights one of the broader issues with alternative win conditions, in that because they change the game for themselves, as well as their opponent, they can also be caught off guard by decks that are just trying to win the game normally. Ash Blossom and Joy Spring and Infinite Impermanence are great examples of this. These two cards are capable of interrupting most decks since they both have so much utility, and as a result see competitive play in every single format. This is an issue for these FDK strategies, as whether you're playing Treasure Panda, Royal Module Library, or even Spellbook Exodia, these cards are still more than capable of putting a stop to your turn, and because they're so prevalent in the modern metagame, it's likely to happen too. Although there are some solutions to this issue. The topping 2012 Exodia list was mainly reliant on draw cards, but it also featured a number of cards included specifically to stop battle damage from being inflicted to the player namely Swift Scarecrow and Wabaku. These cards are absent in more modern decks, the protection they provided is just too weak and slow for the current era, but the theory behind them is sound. 
So, if there were a collection of cards that were capable of stopping your opponent from achieving a normal win condition, and strong enough for the modern era, you'd have more time to reach your win condition. This is the philosophy as to why a lot of alternative win conditions will choose to play floodgates and can be absolutely integral for certain win conditions which require multiple turns in order to resolve. While there are a lot of Exodia decks that use floodgates to their advantage, the alternative win condition that best exemplifies their use is Final Countdown. A normal spell which requires you to pay 2,000 life points to activate it, but if it resolves, you win the duel after 20 turns have passed. Unlike a lot of other win conditions, Final Countdown must take multiple turns to actually resolve. In theory, this makes the card a terrible choice as it gives your opponent 20 turns to win the duel, which is a lot. Especially since most duels in the modern era usually last under 5 turns due to the prevalence of OTK options. However, Final Countdown is arguably one of the best alternative win conditions in the game and is a key choice for Mystic Mind decks. In general, Mystic Mind has always been a great host for win conditions that don't need the battle phase. With a plethora of different win conditions that deviate from the norm, Burn with Cauldron of the Old Man, Deck Out with Runic, and of course Final Countdown Mystic Mind. The reason why it's a popular choice for these strange strategies is just how much Mystic Mind is capable of restricting your opponent's choices. Essentially, if a mine is able to stick to the field while your opponent controls a monster, they're potentially locked out of the game entirely. Your life points are protected since they can't attack you. They can't use monster effects to deal with your mine, nor can they use them to interrupt your win condition. This slows down games to a halt, and allows you multiple turns to fulfill your particular win condition, whether that's completing the destiny board, completing FA winners, or lasting through 20 turns of final countdown. And if your opponent doesn't have an out in their deck, like Cosmic Cyclone or MST, then they've basically lost the duel. There are some win conditions, however, that can't effectively use Mystic Mine because their particular strategy requires monsters to be set up on the field. Venomi Naga and Exodius the Ultimate Forbidden Lord both require being committed to the field in the battle phase in order to actually win the duel with their win conditions, which means that Mystic Mine isn't really a suitable tool to facilitate them in the same way it does for Exodia in Final Countdown. But there are still a plethora of floodgates which can be used to slow the game down. Rivalry of the Warlords, Goes in Match, and There Can Be Only One are all great options in this case as they all restrict the field in a harsh manner. Rivalry only allows a single type of monster on the field. Goes in match only a single attribute, and There Can Be Only One only allows you to control one monster of each type. Each of these cards is devastating against different kinds of strategies. While Rivalry is terrible versus Flu Under Rees, There Can Be Only One destroys it. And while There Can Be Only One does nothing against Super Quants, Goes in match absolutely decimates them. Like Mystic Mine, these floodgates, when used against the correct deck, immensely slow the game down for both players, especially when paired with each other. This allows you to slowly build up your board to the correct board state to bring Venomi Naga and Exodius to the field, and allow them to both attack multiple times over the course of several turns. Venomi Naga to gain Venom counters, and Exodius to send the piece of Exodia to the graveyard. However, there are two main reasons why alternative win conditions aren't the face of trap decks. The first being that while Floodgates are an absolute boon to all win condition strategies, they're not the best decks that can use them. Eldritch and Guru are both decks which are heavily reliant on Floodgates in the same manner as alternative win conditions would be, Skill Drain, Anti-Spell, and Summon Limit are all common tools in the arsenal of these strategies. The main difference, however, is that these particular engines are much stronger when compared to the main engine of an alternative win condition. The Subterror engine represents a free Omni Negate and a Hand Trap with Subterror Fiendness, and the Eldritch engine is comprised of high attack monsters and traps that are capable of interrupting your opponent through pops and graveyard banishes. They both even have ways to OTK with their engines, too. Meanwhile, the engines in most alternative win conditions don't do anything until they win. In the case where you end up drawing a Conquistador or a Scarlet Sanguine, you're holding a competent piece of an engine that can allow you to navigate your opponent's plays. But in the case where you're drawing a Spirit Message A, it doesn't really do anything to stop your opponent from playing the game. The second reason is due to how easy Floodgates are to out due to the way games are played in the TCG and the OCG. This is less of an issue in Master Duel, where games are best of one, so Trap decks have an easier time since they don't have to worry about your opponent's side and back row hate. But games are best of three in the TCG and OCG. This means that while your Mystic Mine or Summon Limit may be capable of letting you resolve an FA Winners during Game 1, it's likely that your opponent is going to have Spell and Trap removal on their side deck to bring in during Games 2 and 3. This is an issue for all Floodgate strategies, but in the case of decks like Eldlich and Guru, they both have ways to recover. Eldlich's traps all have graveyard effects which allow them to set another trap from your deck to replace themselves, and Phoenix's Omni Negate can just negate your opponent's evenly match. When your opponent's playing an alternative win condition, however, your engine doesn't really do anything. Effectively meaning that if your floodgate is outed, it's basically game over. In essence, if you're using an alternative win condition as your engine instead of something else designed to win the game normally, it's likely you're just playing a worse deck. Final Countdown is a solid option for Mystic Mind decks, but because it takes 2,000 life points to activate it, it's explicitly worse than Cauldron of the Old Man, which can win with its burn damage in half the amount of time. 
But as strange as it may sound, for a lot of people, winning isn't the main goal behind playing an alternative win condition. This is because of how absurd some of the specifications for alternative win conditions can get. We already discussed how hard it can be to get out 5 specific cards within your hand, or how hard it can be to last 20 turns, but even those conditions seem easy when compared to some of the more bizarre alternative win conditions out there. These strange win conditions are almost universally regarded as terrible, but inspire certain duelists into trying to make them work anyway. The best example of this is no doubt Flying Elephant, which has the most unique win condition out of any card in the game. In order to begin resolving the condition, the opponent needs to attempt to destroy Flying Elephant with a card effect during their turn. And for one time during your opponent's turn, Flying Elephant will protect itself from that destruction. Then, during the opponent's end phase, if Flying Elephant is still in the field, you must apply its effect which unlocks the final part of its win condition, which basically states that during the next turn, if Flying Elephant manages to inflict damage with a direct attack, you win the duel. While Exodia, Final Countdown, and even Destiny Board represent somewhat realistic ways of winning, Flying Elephant is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Being a condition that's so specific to fulfill, you have to jump through a ton of hoops in order to achieve it, making it really impractical for competitive play. But that's precisely what attracts people to the card. It's less of a viable way of winning, and more of a challenge to build a deck that can win with it, acting as a test of both creativity and skill. Which Yu-Gi-Oh players have a lot of. As for as bad as Flying Elephant's effect is, you can build a deck that can win with its effect, with a large amount of setup, you can give your opponent a Yajiro Invader with Geonator Transversor. Yajiro Invader is a card with a mandatory effect. It activates when an opponent normal or special summons a monster, and Yajiro will move itself one column closer to that monster, and then destroy every card within its own column. By giving Yajiro to your opponent, you can use it to force your opponent to attempt to destroy Flying Elephant, since its effect is mandatory, and it can be paired with something like a Neko Main King to immediately make it the end phase so your opponent doesn't build up a board or remove your Flying Elephant from the field. Now, this obviously is not very practical. It's extremely weak to hand traps, requires multiple bricks to function, and falls apart in the face of any competent board when going second. But people still play these strategies for fun. And there's plenty of alt-win conditions, whose specific condition will change how you build your deck, making it so that every kind of win condition brings its own unique challenge, even if a lot of them share the same inherent downsides of being easily interruptible, like Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief. This card has the win condition that occurs when it has 10 or more materials attached to it. This particular win condition isn't absurd for Ghost Tricks to use in theory, especially since Angel of Mischief has an effect to attach a Ghost Trick card to it once per turn, pairing well with the fairly slow Ghost Trick strategy, especially with Ghost Trick Renovation. But there are also decks dedicated to Angel of Mischief, which uses the Utopia and Utopic monsters alongside rank up magic spells to constantly keep ranking up on a monster and transferring its materials before summoning out Angel of Mischief on top of it to win on their first turn. Another good example of this includes Jackpot 7, which has a win condition which, like Flying Elephant, can only be triggered by your opponent. When it's sent to the graveyard, specifically by an opponent's card effect, it gets banished, and if three Jackpot 7s are banished by this effect, you win the duel. And normally, this win condition would be difficult to achieve because it solely relies on your opponent milling it from your deck a total of three times. Even if your opponent is playing a mill strategy with something like Morphing Jar, they're likely going to stop milling cards once they see that first Jackpot 7 banished. But creative deck builders have found multiple ways in which they can force your opponent to mill the deck for them by giving them a monster. One of which is with the use of Sheen Spy, one of the worst cards in the game since all it does is give your opponent a free monster from your side of the field for the turn. By giving your opponent Dark Scorpion Burglars, you can summon out a bunch of low attack tokens with Hippo Carnival or Super Hippo Carnival and crash them all into Burglars. Burglars' mandatory effect will trigger, which forces you to send a spell card from your deck to the graveyard. And because this is technically an opponent's effect, Jackpot 7 will banish itself, making it a perfect choice to send each time you crash a token. Some win conditions, however, are a lot more simple to set up, such as the only alternative win condition that's currently banned, Last Turn. Last Turn is a normal trap card with an effect that's a ruling's nightmare, but it basically states that you can activate it while your life points are a thousand or less, and when you do, you must select a monster to your side of the field. Then you must send every card in both players' hands in the field to the graveyard, other than your selected monster. Then your opponent gets special summon any monster from the deck in attack position, and then is forced to attack your monster. Whoever has a monster on the field by the end of the battle wins the duel, and any other circumstance results in a draw. Now, technically speaking, last turn is both an alternative win condition and an alternative loss condition, which is pretty bad as there's a chance your opponent will just summon out their highest attack boss monster from the deck and win the duel. In theory, this makes the card an unreliable win condition. But then that begs the question, why is it banned? Likely just because it's a ruling nightmare. But, if the monster you choose at last turn prevents your opponent from special summoning, like say Jiaojin the Spiritualist, your opponent will be incapable of summoning a monster. This means that you'll win the duel via last turn's effect, since your opponent won't control a monster, and there were actually some decks in 2004 that would purposefully lower the life points to try and trigger last will with Jiaojin's face up on the field. All in all, alternative win conditions are a failed mechanic in the competitive sense. 
It's very rare that they see play in a meta or even a tier strategy because of how specific their conditions are. And even those that are played, like Final Countdown, are more of an option for these decks which have a wide array of better choices. But in terms of a mechanic which adds a fun, unique goal for deck building, the mechanic is actually fairly successful in changing how the game is played. With every alternative win condition being played differently depending on the goal that's being achieved, challenging deck builders to make these win conditions workable. With the way the modern metagame works though, it's unlikely that alternative win conditions as they are now are going to be stored with the meta anytime soon. But if a card which was released that had a win condition that was a lot less specific and more easily achievable, it's possible that it may be a good option for certain decks. It's probably a good thing for the moment that alt win conditions aren't seeing too much play though, since if there was an easily achievable win condition, it may just result in constantly getting FDK'd by it whenever you go second. Also, just a quick little aside, we have a Pokemon TCG channel now. So if you like the videos on this channel, well, that channel is basically that, just with the Pokemon TCG. We have a video going over some of the earliest Pokemon cards, so if you like that, you should check it out in the video description or at the end of this video right now.